Good evening, welcome to our evening prayers for Tuesday the 13th of December. Um, I've been having that tune go through my head throughout this Advent as a way of keeping uh, Ukraine in mind. Um, that's the Ukrainian carol of the bells, played of course on bells, or at least simulated ones in that YouTube version by Skunk in the Woods. O oh God, make speed to save us. O Lord, make haste to help us. Because of you, righteous God, we journey to Bethlehem, trusting that you will lead us down the paths of faithfulness. For you, Christ Jesus, we wait on this day of anticipation and hope, in the days of doubt and worry. With you, Spirit of Advent, we serve those for whom this season is not one of joy those whose lives are empty of family and friends. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be forever. Amen. Words from Psalm 85 Lord, you were favourable to your land. You restored the fortunes of Jacob. You forgave the iniquity of your people. You pardoned all their sin. You withdrew all your wrath. You turned from your hot anger. Restore us again, O God of our salvation, and put away your indignation towards us. Will you be angry with us forever? Will you prolong your anger to all generations? Will you not revive us again, so that your people may rejoice in you? Show us your steadfast love, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. Let me hear what God the Lord will speak, for he will speak peace to his people, to his faithful, to those who turn to him in their hearts. Surely his salvation is at hand for those who fear him, that his glory may dwell in our land. Steadfast love and faithfulness will meet, righteousness and peace will kiss each other, faithfulness will spring up from the ground, and righteousness will look down from the sky. The Lord will give what is good, and our land will yield its increase. Righteousness will go before him, and will make a path for his steps. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be forever. Amen. Well, in Advent, we continue to work our way through Sally Welch's book, Sharing the Christmas Story. And the reading which she chooses for this evening is a familiar Christmas reading from Luke chapter 2, the first five verses. Now in those days, an order was published by Caesar Augustus that the whole world should be registered. This was the first registration taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. So all the people went to their hometowns to be registered. Joseph, too, went up from the city of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to the city of David, called Bethlehem, because he was a descendant of the household and family of David. He went there to be registered with Mary, 
who had been promised to him in marriage and was pregnant. Here is the reflection on that passage, entitled Journeys. Historical opinion is mixed about the Emperor Caesar Augustus. His rule ended a long period of conflict and unrest. He brought peace not only to Rome, but also to the surrounding states, while those further away benefited from the stability rippling out from the centre. He rebuilt Rome and developed a wide and efficient road network, formalising an efficient tax regime to pay for it all. According to the Roman Senator Tacitus, writing in the 2nd century AD during the rule of Trajan and Hadrian, Augustus's achievements were many. This is what Tacitus writes in the Annals of Imperial Rome. The empire had been fenced by the ocean or distant rivers. The legions, the provinces, the fleets, the whole administration had been centralised. There had been law for the Roman citizen, respect for the allied communities, and the capital itself had been embellished with remarkable splendour. Very few situations had been treated by force, and then only in the interests of general tranquillity. However, Tacitus was nothing and not even handed, reporting that those who disagreed with this evaluation of the emperor claimed that Augustus was greedy for power, that the PC1 was peace with bloodshed, and that he had left small room for the worship of heaven when he claimed to be himself adored in temples and in the image of Godhead by flamens and by priests. So says Tacitus. It is in the context of this undoubtedly powerful ruler, with equivocal morals and a strong desire to extend the rule of Rome over as much as the world as possible, that Luke begins his story of Jesus' birth. Excuse me. <coughs> as far away as rural Palestine, the iron grip of Rome demonstrates itself in, common, in commanding the population to relocate themselves for the purpose of the census. This census was drawn up so that taxes could be imposed upon all the nations under the rule of Rome. Much money was needed if Rome was to be rebuilt on a grander scale and her borders defended against her enemies. So, with no regard for its impact upon the lives and fortunes of the conquered thousands, a decree was sent out. A population was ordered on the move, unaware of the purpose behind the order, but forced to comply anyway. Mary and Joseph arrived at Bethlehem too late to find suitable accommodation and had to make do with what was available. Their son was born in a room allocated to animals adjacent to an inn. What a demonstration of the huge gap between powerful and powerless. An emperor orders a census and a pregnant woman and her husband must travel 90 hard miles to comply. So, the birth of Christ underlines what sort of ruler the Messiah will be. All previous expectations will be overturned. All established principles of power toppled as the Son of God, in the words of Philippians chapter 2, emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness. So begins the new kingdom, anticipated by Mary in her song of joy, he has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. This is a kingdom built not on bloodshed and slavery, but on peace and equality. Not on political machinations and deceit, but on openness and hospitality. Not on pride and power, but on humility and love. Even at the height of Augustus's reign, the Roman Empire was being undermined by the rule of Christ. Soon, news of that rule would spread throughout the world, bringing hope to all who long for a new way of living. We are many centuries away from the empire of Augustus, but still wealth is power. The poor are oppressed, and millions of people live in poverty and despair. We can play our part in overturning the reign of selfishness and greed by being alert to its signs among our own actions and the actions of our communities. We can help to bring near we can help to bring near the kingdom of God by our promotion of peace, our generosity of spirit, and our love for those with whom we share our lives. Amen. And 
Sally Welch leaves us with the question, how might we undermine the concepts that might is right and that wealth is power? Something to ponder. Uh, you will have spotted I'm not in my usual surroundings tonight. Uh, I've broken off from uh, rehearsals for our church pantomime this Saturday. Um, and I'm in the vestry here at St Andrews with Castlegate in Nottingham. So let's have some music from St Andrews with Castlegate. This is our church choir singing uh, a lovely American anthem called By Candlelight, written by Ruth Elaine Schramm. And here they are singing on the first Sunday of Advent this year.
The only thing with being in the vestry this evening is that if I don't keep moving, the lights turn off of their own accord. So, uh, sorry about that. Let us pray. See, you come, clarifier of our hearts, playing salvation's love song on a baritone sax, preparing the way for grace to transform our souls, holding us in your heart when we lose our way. See, you come, tender mercy, filling in poverty's potholes with grace's riches, tearing down cruelty-capped oppression, straightening out the winding paths, soothing the lonely nights of rough sleepers. See, you come, eyes of grace, so in seeing the suffering around us we might share mercy, in observing the struggles of others, we might give offerings of justice. In noticing the silence of leaders, we would cry out for hope. See you come, God in community, holy in one, so that we might be your people of grace and justice. Amen. And how beautifully our friend Tom's words in that prayer tie in with the reflection this evening in our prayers of intercession tonight the refrain if you'd like to join in is simply hear our prayer i say god of mercy hear our prayer let us pray sorry at evening time let us offer our prayers to god let us pray for the church that we may be moved to pursue truth and justice. God of mercy, hear our prayer. Let us pray for the whole earth, that we may protect the beauty of creation. God of mercy, hear our prayer. Let us pray for our community, for those who lead us in faith, and for those we serve. On Tuesday evenings in our cycle of prayer, we think particularly of the ministers, elders, and members of our URC churches in Leicestershire, and also of all our ecumenical partners there. Knowing too that there are meetings going on this evening where hard decisions need to be taken. Um, we pray also for those churches and congregations uh, facing a difficult path and for those who lead them in their deliberations. God of mercy, hear our prayer. Let us pray for those who suffer from illness, oppression or despair. We think especially of the Reverend Jenny Mills, ah, recovering after a stay in hospital. We pray with the Reverend Claire and Reverend Brian Davison for Susie, their daughter, in hospital now. For the Reverend Derek Hopkins, recovering at home from his hospital stay. With the Reverend Solomon and Paulina R. Ye Brown, for Paulina's father, Kwaku with the Reverend Samuel and Evelyn Silungwe, for Evelyn's father, Labson, for the Reverend Martin Ferris, as he awaits hospital test results, for the Reverend Stanley Crane in his continued recovery from surgery, for the Reverend Michael Forster and Jean Forster, the Reverend Graham and Vera Maskery, and for Moynia's parish priest, Father Andy, we pray too tonight with Liz, for her great nephew Ryan, for her daughter Emma, and Emma's young son Leon. We pray with Prince, for Cheryl, with Andy, for his dad Mike, and for Liz and Ruth in their ongoing care of him, with Paul and Alison, for Pat. 
with Tom, but his brother Mike, recovering from triple bypass surgery. For all those for whom this is not the most wonderful time of the year. And in a short moment of silence, for those known especially to us. We pray that all those in need of your presence will know you with them tonight. God of mercy, hear our prayer. And let us pray with those who now rejoice in God's presence, that one day we may come with them to the fullness of God's reign. And we pray for all who grieve the passing of loved ones, especially at this time, for those who grieve for the Reverend Doug Watson, for those who grieve for Bridget, Bridget Moira, especially the Reverend George Moira and family. For those who grieve for Sylvia Poulton, especially Charlotte and Martin, Steve and Diane. And for those who grieve for Keyes Maxey, especially the Reverend Ruth Maxey, his daughter and family. God of mercy, hear our prayer. Holy God, we give you thanks for having brought us to the end of this day. Let our prayer arise before you, and may your blessing descend upon us. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Excuse me. <coughs> Sorry about that. Let's conclude our prayers um, in the words of the Lord's Prayer in whichever form you know it best. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. We'll return to the Carol of the Bells, a Ukrainian Christmas favourite, to play us out tonight. And in this case... The singers of St Augustine's Catholic High School in, I believe, Worcester. The Lord bless us with his grace and fill us with his peace. Amen. <laughs>